welcome all. Uh, whether you're tuning in after the fact um, on a different platform where you're here right now, appreciate you guys for coming. Um, as usual, uh, it's your boy Hunter, the community manager over here at Optian Labs, aka Arbitrum. We have uh, Peter Heyman over here, uh, also uh, working with uh, business development over here as well. Um, and of course, we're joined today by DAM Finance, or DAMM, as you just heard. Uh, Joshua, how are we doing? Wonderful, wonderful. Glad to get a good start to the week. Yeah. How about yourselves? Lovely. Lovely. Just happy to wake up. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> best, awesome. way to start a, best way to start a Monday is to do an AMA with DAM Finance. <laughs> thank, Literally. thank you. <laughs> so before we actually do jump into the nitty gritty, um, if you don't mind, uh, Joshua, can you maybe like give us like uh, just you know a little explainer of what uh, kind of damn finance is and a little bit about yourself in terms of like your role there and how you kind of arrived at working a damn dot finance or kind of building it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just a little bit of background on myself. Um, I helped start uh, System Nine, uh, one of the larger altcoin market makers in crypto, um, and so you know. DAM is kind of the protocol that we wish existed um, and kind of coincidentally at the perfect timing as well with like, you know, the blow up of Celsius, BlockFi, Voyager, um, um, you know, DAMM addresses the problem that like, you know, inevitably was going to happen with Celsius and, you know, Genesis and all these major institutional lenders, which is the lack of transparency. So it's a uh, DAMM is an on-chain institutional lending platform. Kind of like Maple Finance or Clearpool, if you're familiar with either of them. Uh, but, you know, Maple and Clearpool pretty much exclusively focus on USDC lending or ETH lending. Uh, DAMM is for any token. Um, hence why, you know, we're launching on, uh, you know, Arbitrum soon, as well as ETH mainnet, um, with the focus on listing and uh, allowing institutions to borrow and lend as many tokens as possible. Yeah. No, that's awesome. I mean... I think this is super critical for, you know, large scale adoption. Um, I mean, we, like you said, you, we've seen this with Maple Finance, but, you know, being able to expand to more tokens, I think is, is really important there. And I think you, you alluded to this in, in, the, in the, uh, your previous answer, but um, how do you see, you know, what you guys are doing as opposed to, you know, the approach that like, let's say Compound and Aave took uh, from a lending and borrowing perspective? Yeah. So the issue with Compound, Ave, and like, you know, even Euler, Cream, you know, a lot of these over collateralized lending platforms is that they're so capital inefficient, um, which when you're a market maker, capital, ineffic capital inefficiencies, you know, kind of can kill your trades. You really do need the ability to borrow up against your balance sheet uh, with legal agreements. And so that's not something you can really do on chain without some form of a centralized credit risk entity. Um, but what you can do is you can put all the information about the borrows on chain, as well as who's borrowing, what uh, you know, what tokens are they borrowing, how long are they holding them, what exchanges are they moving them to, um, where are they yield farming them, um, and so that's kind of our primary focus. Um, and kind of, I think that the issue with the over collateralized platforms outside of the capital inefficiency is just that they're, you know limited obviously by oracle risks and there's been a ton of smart contract exploits as a result because you know if you're going to accept altcoins as collateral generally you know that's such a such a volatile asset and can lead to a lot of you know oracle manipulation to have hacks like what happened on cream for example uh, so there's like a number of reasons market makers don't really use them at scale and why they really do use things like clearpool and maple and trufi um, instead so No, that makes a ton of sense. Uh, I think you were you were also uh, mentioning this too as well. But it's like, how does Dam bring transparency to to lending uh, from your perspective? Oh yeah, I, I think a good way to show how Dam brings transparency is to kind of compare it to the current existing institutional lenders. So let's like look at Celsius for example. Uh, if you are a lender to Celsius, you have absolutely no idea who they're lending to. You have no idea who your counterparty is, um, what trading firms you're lending to, what strategies they prioritize. And, you know, as a result, you get things like a billion dollars in losses from lending to Anchor. You know, a lot of really, you know, uh, you know a lot of lack of transparency, per se. Because you're just, I mean, even though everything is on chain, 
you don't know who they're lending to. They're not labeled addresses. No one's KYC, all that. Um, so what DAMM does is it allows you to, whenever you lend to a pool, um, like let's say you lend GMX on Arbitrum, um, you'll be able to actually see every single market maker's address labeled and KYC'd uh, and KYV'd in the case of businesses. You'll be able to see their address, how much they're borrowing, and the actual transactions and where they are moving funds to, what exchanges they're depositing to, are they moving it to Binance, are they moving it to OKX, uh, how much, what quantities, um, are they doing any kind of yield farming strategies or you know centralized uh, to decentralized arbitrage strategies. You'll be able to see all those things. So yeah, that's, that's really how we bring it. And also, um, not only that, you'll be able to see how much they're allowed to borrow um, which is, you know, another pretty critical factor um, because, you know, a lot of these firms, some of them are more well-known, some aren't, some are regulated, some aren't. Um, so you'll want to see, like, you know, what's the risk level that, you know, the DAMM Foundation and pool delegates we onboard are accepting for each borrower. So, yeah. Cool, cool. Awesome. And, and I think, um, you know, one thing that kind of is a uh... – this is kind of more of an obvious question for maybe even the people listening here is, you know, uh, you know, to, to what extent are people allowed to kind of borrow, uh, you know, like, you know, from a dam, you know, is it only institutional people? Is it people that are only KYC? Is it anyone just on chain that has a wallet? Um, we'd love to know more about that. Yeah. So to start with, um, we are, ex so for our institutional lending, we're exclusively onboarding market makers. So no long short funds. And the specific reason for that is, you know, the reason as well, like, kind of like the two primary factors for a lot of the institutional lenders blowing up recently was, you know, Three Arrows plus, uh, you know, Luna Terra. Um, and so Three Arrows, uh, that could have been avoided pretty easily by focusing exclusively on market making firms, um, you know, because Three Arrows was openly a long hedge fund. I mean, they did not, you know, advertise themselves as a market maker or a market neutral trading firm. Um, and if you look, pretty much all the market neutral trading firms have gotten out of this, you know, downturn pretty much scot free because, you know, generally speaking, they're completely delta neutral or hedged. Uh, so whether the market moves up or down, it doesn't affect them. Uh, or if it does, it's you know generally much much more mild than you know a long only hedge fund. Um, so we're only onboarding institutional market makers that are market neutral, and we're using our partner uh, X Margin. I believe they now renamed to Credera. Um, to get access to their exchange API keys uh, so that we can actually see their net exposure to the market 24-7. So, you know, we're providing minute-by-minute data about how long or short they are um, and can lower their borrow limits the more, the more long or the more short they get. Uh, so that's how we're picking institutions. We do plan on opening up um, over collateralized borrowing to anyone uh, in the future, but that's just a, that's something we're building now. That'll probably be uh, Q1 next year. Yeah, you know, it's definitely a very interesting topic because I, I feel like, um, but you know, obviously in in, in, this, in this world where everything is very mainly kind of you know, uh, you know, quote unquote, kind of decentralized, anonymous, uh, you know, very crypto, I guess is the word really that kind of engulfs mm -hmm. all that stuff. Uh, I think you know people tend to do like you know maybe like kind of like look down upon anything that has any type of centralization in it. Which I mean, if you ask me, I think you know decentralization is is really just. Um, it's more of like a, uh, how do you call that? Um, like, it's not like a black and white thing. It's a spectrum, right? Exactly, yeah. So, I, you know, I'm very interested to kind of just maybe hear a little more about, you know, like your thoughts kind of on that and kind of roll, rolling, that, rolling that out first. Because, I mean, you know, obviously you guys could have started, you know, doing, doing it the opposite way, right? But I guess there's obviously a reason why you started with kind of, let's do an institutional first and then kind of from there, roll it out to people over time. Yeah, 100%. I, I think... In crypto thus far, you've seen exactly like you said, like there's been this black and white, you know, you're an entirely centralized product, like a, you know, a centralized exchange, or you're a completely decentralized product, like most DAOs or DEXs or whatnot. Um, and there's really been a lack of, you know, products in the middle, um, or, you know, kind of that hybrid centralized, decentralized model where maybe portions are centralized and portions are decentralized. And that's really what we're going after. So our goal is by the uh, end of next year to completely have everything but the credit risk portion of the protocol decentralized. So all utilization rate management, you know, just like Aave and Compound, um, 
but except for the under collateralized lending that that being you know completely managed by a centralized credit risk entity um you know but everything else on the protocol we do want um completely decentralized and i think you're going to see a lot of protocols that are you know that hybrid centralized decentralized model coming out in the next few years um i i you know we we've been speaking to quite a few and i think there's a really you know there's a ton of uh, market opportunity there that uh, has kind of been left out uh, over the last few years. Hundred percent. It's definitely you know the the direction of the space is is changing and and I think changing for the better where we're going to see more capital inflows uh, come into the system. Uh, but with that being said, like how how does Dam uh, discriminate against short selling uh, from your perspective? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Because like a lot of token issuers are onboarding with us and that's kind of the thing they're worried about. And like, you know, we kind of give them two answers that are kind of contradictory. <laughs> Number one is, you know, short selling is a natural part of every healthy market. You know, it's been in equities forever. And I think the saying that a lot of, you know, uh, bankers use is like, you know, short selling's never killed a company. Uh, Might have just hurt the stock price in the short term, but it's never a long term thing. And the second thing we say is, you know, the way we actually do discriminate against that and, you know, whether a market maker was going completely long or short, we would discriminate against that. And the way we do it's through our credit risk partner, uh, X Margin. Um, we are able to see uh, every borrower we onboard's live positions on it. They provide X Margin their API keys for exchange accounts. And we can see, are they, you know, long? Have they bought a bunch of spot Bitcoin and Ethereum? And are they super long the market? Um, like a three arrows, or are they really short the market right now? Do they expect prices to go down? Um, and we actually lower their limits, uh, whether they go long or short, uh, minute by minute, you know, as we are fed new data. So that's really how we, uh, you know, treat treat our borrowers. And, you know, the more market neutral, the more, you know, delta neutral our market makers are, you know, the larger the borrow limits they get versus their balance sheet. So. That's great. And I, like maybe one other thing is, uh, you know, DAM can be this, or at least from what I see, it can be this like critical infrastructure um, that's, you know, useful in the Arbitrum ecosystem as we've, you know, gone and expanded you know, our DeFi ecosystem where, you know, now after Nitro, we may have almost every major, you know, DeFi team that's building on top of Arbitrum today. So, how do you see DAM integrating, you know, within the ecosystem itself and and providing value there? Yeah, I think it's I think um, institutional lending. You know, I actually expect there to be multiple platforms like us in the future that are doing institutional lending for any token. Um, I think the industry is kind of moving towards that, just like it is in TradFi. I think the way you know we see ourselves being the best ecosystem partner possible is. You know, DeFi protocols, generally speaking, have a really hard time expanding to centralized audiences. There's kind of two ecosystems in crypto right now, I see. You know, there's the centralized world and the decentralized world. Pretty much everybody who knows how to use MetaMask versus everybody who just sits on Binance. <laughs> um, and so I, I think, you know, by allowing these DeFi protocols to get exposure to centralized markets and, uh, you know, centralized exchanges, because we have a lot of exchanges that plan on borrowing from us to list assets. That way, they don't have to go buy the spot tokens. Um, you know, we actually really foresee a ton of protocols getting you know exposure and users that they otherwise never would have. Um, and I think that's a really big positive for DeFi because it you know opens up you know to the you know newer crypto people who are just onboarding to centralized exchanges and lets them see, hey, wow, there's this really cool project that I'd never heard of, and now I can actually learn how to use it and go onboard with them and make a wallet. You know, interact, deposit, all that. Yeah. I think what would be really interesting, especially, uh, you know, for a lot of people already in the ecosystem, um, you know, is not only obviously being able to kind of, you know, be able to borrow, lend a borrow, I mean, uh, you know, using like these, you know, like like some of the classic Arbitrum tokens, right? Like, you know, like the, like the DPXs, the GMXs, the, the magics of the world. But also even like, for example, I think there's this product called uh, GLP from GMX, and, you know, in essence, you know, you know, people are able to kind of get their own kind of like ETH yield from that, from like holding GLP, essentially, uh, you know, kind of like the whole, I think, I think it's kind of like part of like this hashtag real yield movement that's going on in Arbitrum right now, where it's like, instead yeah. of kind of inflating with these kind of, you know, random tokens, you're getting just ETH yield. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I, I think like an integration like that would be like so interesting. 
Oh, I, I think that you're a hundred percent right. I think a lot of like, I think, you know, the reason we, we aren't using, we aren't doing liquidity mining for that exact reason. We have a new model that's, you know, it's, it's, if you want to check out more information on liquidity bonding, there is in our docs on our website. Um, I'd recommend checking it out if you guys are interested, but I, exactly right. I don't think liquidity mining in general is going to survive much longer because if you just look at the economics of it, I mean, your cost of acquisition for a user is just so high. I mean, you're basically just minting equity to give to users. Um, and so I see that, you know, that fake yield kind of going away and moving more towards like the only products that are going to survive in crypto going forward are going to be the ones that are actually providing, you know, net economic value. So, you know, lending and borrowing protocols, exchanges, you know, uh, options, trading vaults, things that are, you know, strategies like Yearn and GMX, like it's, you have to have a real product. You can't just be minting tokens and, you know, dumping them on users' sins. Um, you know, there has to be an underlying core, you know, decentralized or centralized business that's, you know, the token is controlling in some capacity. Um, so I definitely see that, like, I, real yield 100% is going to be the uh, the future of crypto. So, yeah. There we go. We're, you know, we are all pioneering it together over here at Arbitrum. <laughs> you guys 100%, included. 100%. So I think we'd love to know a little bit more also uh, just about your roadmap generally, uh, you know, like kind of when people can, uh, can kind of maybe expect to see uh, damn finance and Arbitrum maybe, or just any, any other plans you guys are plan uh, you know, have in mind. Absolutely. Yeah. So we're, we're really close to launching on mainnet and our on and, and on Arbitrum um, likely in the next uh, few weeks, expect some expected date from us in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we're really, really excited. Been a lot of, uh, you know, work on our side, onboarding tokens and everything like that. Um, uh, incredibly excited to come to Arbitrum. We've gotten a lot of interest already from a number of protocols that are on Arbitrum about lending directly. So quite excited about that and hope everybody comes and uh, deposits on DAM then. Um, we, we plan on launching uh, DAMM, the core product, the institutional lending platform um, in the next couple of weeks, as I mentioned. Um, we have a new product as well that I think is more, you know, token issuer focused called RAMM. That's a, um, you know, uh, decentralized, it's actually a properly de completely decentralized uh, request a market maker platform. So, you know, really bringing transparency to the dedicated market maker business, uh, you know, guys like the businesses of people like Wintermute, you know, GSR, or Alameda, uh, really putting all of that on chain for token issuers to get, you know, bids on their market making deals. Um, and so that's probably going to be coming out likely towards, uh, let's say, probably November, December. Uh, so yeah, a lot, lot of stuff coming out this year. That's awesome. I I know that you know market makers are definitely playing a larger role in the Arbitrum ecosystem. Like I saw this with Hashflow, but there's definitely you know yeah. others that are yeah yeah that are participating. So that, no, that's great to um, great to hear from your end. <laughs> I mean, and it's really nice too because like I think you know DAM and RAMM, um, you know, they kind of both solve this problem of you know. A lot of, you know, Arbitrum and like you could even say like most chains in crypto that just aren't ETH mainnet, like a lot of times what happens is their tokens will get a ton of centralized exchange trading, but typically the DEXs, the DEX volume will lack um, in relation. And a lot of times I think that has to do with the fact that the market makers can't, you know, it's, it's either hard for them or they don't, aren't, they aren't familiar enough with the chain generally to go, you know, move tokens onto DEXs on that platform without doing their own smart contract audits and everything like that. So I think, you know, DM and RMM are going to bring a ton of positive externalities in bringing market makers to on-chain trading of, um, you know, different blockchains. So I think that's going to be another, you know, big net positive as well. Awesome, yeah. And, and I think, by the way, this may be a, a good time to maybe uh, move on to some questions that anyone in the crowd may have. Um, to, I, I know we're operating like like a thirty minute time schedule here, so I want to be cognizant okay. of that. Um, anyone in the crowd, feel free to raise your hand. We'll bring you up, and you can ask us a question, whether it be a damn finance or us. Uh, but before I even do that, I do want to ask you my own selfish question. I apologize. Um, <laughs> is um, so one thing that I'm sure you you noticed with crypto that's been very hot recently, um, obviously, are NFTs. Uh, do you guys have any type of integration planned? Or maybe the ability to maybe lend or borrow NFTs, both obviously from an institutional perspective and uh, just, uh, you know, I mean, the basic one. That's a really, really interesting question. Because like, you know, uh, it, putting my market making hat on, 
Something that, you know, we were even looking at about six months ago, nine months ago was market making NFTs. And I think there is definitely a market there because if you look at how like OpenSea and, you know, a lot of different, you know, um, NFT marketplaces trade, they're very similar in the way altcoins trade. Um, it's actually kind of, it's very odd. Uh, they trade very similarly, like the floor generally is the spread. Um, it, I think it's a very, very interesting opportunity. And I think, uh, yeah, we, we, we've we definitely kind of chatted about that internally. And I, I definitely expect some, there some, to be something like that coming soon. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know how soon, but just because it is a bit of a, bit of a tech build to, you know, convert everything from ERC-20s to ERC-721s uh, or the respective NFT uh, platform or different standards on different blockchains. But um, institutional NFT borrowing, I definitely expect to be a thing. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's, you know, definitely one thing that, uh, you know, right now I feel like hasn't obviously caught on quite yet because I feel like there isn't really anyone who's done We've either done it or even, I mean, I'm not even aware of anyone who's done it, but if there is someone who's done it yet, I guess there's no demand for it yet. Um, But I'm truly, I'm truly interested to see that kind of be the next, I want to say phase maybe of crypto. Like, you know, you're familiar. We have, you have different kind of phases throughout, throughout, throughout each year in crypto. And I think that'd be a really cool one. Just when we see people lending and borrowing their, their, their NFTs, you know? Yeah, it is basically, if you ever post an NFT and you see like all those like, you know, bot bids, those are almost guaranteed to be an institutional market maker. I mean, very rarely are they like an individual trader, just given the size, especially on like the larger cap blue chip NFTs. So I, I completely believe that there will be institutional borrowing of NFTs. Yeah. There are market makers that have like 10 plus NFT deals where they're the, they're lent, uh, they're lent NFTs to market make. Uh, it's a, it's kind of becoming a smaller niche market of the altcoin market making space, and it's kind of a very, very interesting, uh, like little little subgenre of it, I guess. De- DeFi is eating everything. <laughs> yeah, um, for sure. <laughs> uh, definitely. Uh, so I, I think, uh, as Hunter alluded to, this is the the portion of. Uh, of the AMA where we can invite somebody from the crowd. It looks like we have one person here, uh, which I invited to speak. Um, but if anybody else would like to, feel free to raise your hand and we can invite you up here to ask any questions. Oh, see another request. Moen. I invited you up. Here we go. Hi. Here we go. Hey. When Odyssey started? Sorry? Oh. I assume he's Odyssey. talking about the Odyssey. He's like, no, the Odyssey, correct? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, one second. Um, the Odyssey will begin soon once Nitro hits mainnet. Uh, <laughs> nothing related to damn finance, unfortunately, Joshua. Uh, but. It, oh, no, it's ours. It, in, in, in a way, though, it will bring more uh, users to Arbitrum, making them, you know, making it easier for them to onboard themselves in the damn finance as well. So, still relevant, still very relevant. Uh, but yes, moment, it's going to be after uh, Nitro launches, um, and any updates on that will be in the announcements channel. Anytime, like one month, one week. Unfortunately, not, my friend. Too much alpha. Way too much alpha for a, for an AMA. <laughs> <laughs> I already spilled. I've already spilled enough beans, but definitely uh, stay tuned uh, to the announcements channel. Okay, thanks. Thank you for coming on, my friend. Cool. I also invited Joseph Justice. It's another guy, Joy DX. Yeah, guys. Right. Uh, hello, everyone. <laughs> hey. Um. Greetings from Kenya, man. I want to know um, when exactly is Nitro starting then? When is it shipping? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, no, Nitro. Um, so similar question to what, to what, I, to what I answered with the Moen. Um, it, it'll be, so currently the, the uh, testnet merge for Incubi already happened. Um, so you can test your apps already on uh, some of the testnets that we already have open. But the actual mainnet uh, is still TBD. We have not announced it yet. Just know it's coming soon. 
All right. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Cool. And uh, looks like Joy DX is also here. Hello. Hello. Hey. Hey, Thanks. I want. I want to know actually the Arbitrum have uh, governance token. When they launch, there's no token, my friend. <laughs> no yeah, token. No token. So there is a no plan. There is no token. That, that, that's all we can say, unfortunately. Or I plead the fifth. Isn't, isn't that what they say over here in, in, uh, in the States, Peter? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> you have to plead the fifth. Plead the fifth. <laughs> uh, but yes, no, there's no token. Um, I'm going to disconnect you just in case, because you start asking more yeah. complicated questions. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, good call on that one. <laughs> um, okay, well. Uh, for what it's worth, let me, let me just check the AMA chat real quick. You said, someone said, but did I hear it? Did I hear another Odyssey question? Yeah. Um, Thanks, Bagel. I, um, oh, I guess I guess we have one question in the crowd here by uh, Castle. Um, I guess the, I mean, and this is definitely more towards more for you guys. Um, uh, what is your, I guess, um, current stance on like you know the uh, any audits on, on on the system? Oh yeah. What? So we. Oh sorry. Yeah, you're good. Oh, oh, I didn't know if you said something else. Apologies. Um, yeah, so we, we have a security audit done. I think our uh, the, our official account posted the link to it in the AMA chat. Um, it was done by DDALB. Um, we actually have another auditor as well that we're in the middle of having a second audit completed with. Um, yeah, so we you know we built on um, a version of the like every single DAMM pool is a compound pool with a borrower framework built on top of it. Um, to restrict borrowing to exclusively whitelisted addresses that are, you know, KYC and approved by the foundation. Um, and as their borrow limits are also set by the foundation. Um, all our code's open source. We're going to be publishing a bounty on it too soon for, uh, you know, any bugs, anything anybody finds. Um, yeah, so we, you know, just given, you know, the nature of liquidity bulls and, you know, uh, how frequent, you know, security flaws are in them. You know, we wanted to use only, you know, code that had been audited, you know, dozens of times in Compound and, um, you know, get our own audits done as well on any edits we make, you know, before we ever roll out anything. You know, it's pretty much good industry standard and just to have your code audited typically multiple times. Um, so, yeah. That's awesome. I mean, for sure, that's one of the questions that we ask teams, as you know, before we uh, do anything. So it's great to hear that you're taking security seriously, especially with audits. Um, one other thing is I saw a question here from Bursting Bagel in the AMA. He said, can you talk a little bit more about the DAM token and how it's interwoven into the platform? Yeah, so uh, just so everybody knows, um, you know, we're not doing any liquidity mining, but we are doing liquidity bonding. So You'll be getting bonded DAMM um, deposited. You know, it, it's going to be starting to accrue immediately uh, upon the launch of the platform. It won't be redeemable for DAMM uh, for at least another month or two um, after the launch. Um, you know, but the way the DAMM token works is outside of governance for you know the major pools. I, I think like if you want a good analogy on the governance side, um, you know, Ave and Compound managing interest rates, you know, managing reserve rates, things like that. That's all included uh, in the DAMM token. Um, but included as well as, you know, direct protocol revenue sharing. So uh, about, I think we're targeting 7.5% to 10% uh, on launch of the protocol's revenue. So interest paid by market makers to the lending pools gets routed to uh, staked DAMM holders, kind of like Curve, uh, or, you know, we're calling it a VDAM or, um, you know, internally, uh, vote escrow DAM uh, for governance. And so you'll be receiving straight up, you know, seven and a half, ten percent of the protocol's revenue in stable coins uh, directly. Uh, so, you know, that's how the tokens interwoven. Um, you know, it, it allows us to kind of move more towards a decentralized model um, over the you know next year, um, outside of the credit risk management. So, yeah, that's kind of the uh, the high level of the token. That's awesome. We love uh, love getting that alpha right at the very end of the AMA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. fee sharing turned on. Day one. <laughs> yeah. It's awesome. Cool. 
Cool. So I, I think maybe just to kind of end things off here, again, cognizant of the time, um, just for people in general in the audience who want to get involved with damn finance, uh, maybe you want to just, you know, either contribute or just be part of the community and, you know, uh, be aware when there are new updates, uh, where can they go uh, to do that? Yeah, absolutely. Check out uh, damm.finance. That's our website. We have our Discord uh, link at the top there on the community um, tab. It goes direct to our Discord. Feel free to chat with us there, our teams there, and we're, you know, taking, you know, we answer questions publicly. So more than happy to answer any more anybody has. Uh, I would say that's probably the main place. And then we'll be launching the app on damm.finance uh, likely the next couple of weeks. So very excited to have everybody on and uh, have Arbitrum on. Very excited. Great, so yeah, and you thank you for coming on. <laughs> really yeah, thank, it, thank, thanks for being here. Of course, yeah. thanks so much, everybody, and, for listening in. Yeah, thanks for everyone for tuning in. If you join late, we'll also try to make sure to update this uh, on YouTube later on this week, so you can just you know listen to the playback. With that being said, uh, yeah, thank you guys for coming on today, Peter, Josh. We'll see you guys later. Have a great one. Bye bye. Have a good one.